two tube problem sheets, uh, two data sheets, one set of notes, and um, I think that's it. Where have you all come from? Where? All the stories Ah, right, okay. We're going to have to get our skates on now, which is just code for the same material, but we're going. So I promised you some um, some examples of how we deal with noise because the last lecture was rather uh, dealt with um, concepts rather than actually how you do stuff. So that's what I intend to do now. We need to talk a little bit about electronic systems which contain components. Yesterday we were, well yesterday, <laughs> I remember as if it was yesterday. Um, the last lecture we were talking about what happens to noise in individual bits. Now I want to think about what happens in, in big systems of circuits. So resistors, transistors and diodes add noise to circuits and inductors and capacitors can shape that noise. But ideal inductors and capacitors don't generate their own. In the last lecture, which I watched back recently, I said noise across capacitors K0 to C. And I didn't make sufficiently clear that the noise of that KT is the noise of the source resistance. It's not intrinsic to the capacitor. But I'll put a little note on the video to say so. So to combine the contribution of every noise source, taking the Thevenin and Norton approach as we used, as we talked about in the last lecture, <coughs> very quickly become impractical to make an attempt at a solution on a pen, a pen and paper. So we tend not to do that, because we want to simplify everything if we can. So what we want to, to have is a circuit which doesn't have any noise, and then at the front of it, a noise source composed of a voltage and a current, which represents the noise that all of that circuit would add. So we don't have to worry about the individual noise sources, we just lump them all together at the front. And then we can compare it with the signal and see how much signal to noise ratio there is. So that would be an equivalent circuit, and by now I hope when I say equivalent circuit you don't all think, oh god, not another one. The point of all this noise stuff is that it's only difficult if you can't get past the statistics at the start. <coughs> After that, it's Kirchhoff, Thevenin, Norton, potential dividers, current sharing circuits. And you can do all those anyway. It's just the voltage sources now have a full set of units attached, and so the current sources. So in what remains of this lecture, we will focus on the metrics of noise performance that are used at high frequencies. That's to say above about 30 megahertz or so. And we will worry about unmatched systems, which is less than 30 megahertz, uh, when we meet next time. And that lecture next time will be the last one you get from me, probably, unless I'm feeling really zealous and I come back after Neil to do a bit more, because I love it. Not electronics, I just love torturing you. I need to stand in the right place so I can do that. Um, so, in high frequency work, which is above 30 megahertz, amplifiers are often thought of about how they affect the power in the system. If you can get deep enough into your Samsung options, it will tell you the power that it's receiving from the GPS system, and it will be in dBm, which is decibels below a millivolt. A milliwatt, Ooh, nearly. A milliwatt, not a millivolt. These are the high frequency systems. So we shan't deal with amps and volts, they will all be done in watts. Which shouldn't be that surprising because last time we met, we dealt with what happens to power in, in noise. And we said we couldn't use amplitude easily. So the fact that we're carrying on with power is a good thing. So we need to decide how much noise there is with respect to the signal. The actual quantity of noise, not very significant, often. We, we need to worry about how much signal strength there is with respect to the noise that we've got in the system. The actual value of the signal and noise don't really have to come into it, you divide one by the other. So you'd express it in decibels and it's 10 log because it's power, that's signal power and noise power. And it's a measure of the signal quality. <laughs> doesn't tell you anything about the size of the signal at all, nor the size of the noise. 
and it will change depending on where you measure it. You measure it um, on a certain node in a, a circuit, you'll get a value, and that value may go up or down as you pass through the circuit. Usually we're only worried about the input and the output, and that's where we'll make our comparison. So for the, I've got a little, quite a large amplifier here. Um, SI is the signal input power, NI is the noise input power. That's the noise that enters the system from the source. We've got the noise output, which is NO, and that's the power gain of the system, AUT, times the noise input to the system from the source. If it's a resistive source, it'll be 4KTR, delta F. Um, this is all in there, last time's notes. Um, plus the noise that the amplifier adds, NA, A for amplifier, or A for add, if you prefer. The signal output, on the other hand, and the signal input times the power gain of the system. Signals measured in watts, noise measured in watts if we know the bandwidth, or watts per hertz if we don't know the bandwidth. Happy the signal to noise ratio. Hmm? It's like gain measured in dBs except for noise. <coughs> So we can also have a noise factor, which is a measure of the extra noise that this particular circuit that we're looking at adds to a larger system. It also doesn't tell us how much noise there is or how big the signal is. It doesn't even tell us how corrupted the signal is by the noise. All it tells us is how much extra noise the particular thing we know the noise factor of will put into our system. So it's the signal to noise ratio at the input. So, right. Yeah, I changed it on there, it went on there. How did that happen? It's SI over NI divided by SO over NO. And it doesn't have any units. It's watts over watts squared per hertz over watts over watts squared per hertz. And if the power gain of the system is AP, which I, I said it was in the prior slide, F becomes NO over AP NI. Are you happy with that? I'll be wanting to show you how it's done. Because it's not in the slides. Yeah, okay. It's um, in a straw poll of one person, red turned out to be the best colour. And this is a new pen, and it's not my fault. Right, so we get SI. Is that big enough? Can you actually see it? SI over um, NI over SO over NA. So, by some high school mathematics, I can write that as SI over NI uh, times NO over SO. Hmm? And uh, SI is just, sorry, SO is AP times SI. So, I can rewrite this as SI times AB. Hmm? In that case, that and that goes, sorry, that's NI. And I've got NO over NI times AB, which is, which is the next slide down. So there's no magic involved, it's a, a reasonably simple one. I'll tell you what, just for the benefit of all the people who don't want to get out of bed or want to hear it again. There we go. See, this is how much your tuition fees are. I'm my own counter person. <laughs> I'll cleverly cut that as well. Um, right. So everybody happy with how I got to four? Equation number four on the slide. <coughs> Fine, almost there. So the idea of noise factor, this extra noise that a system adds, or an extra metric of the noise the system adds, is very useful for multi-stage amplifiers. Is that a Twinkie? If it is, can I have one? <laughs> Never mind. Twinkies are really rusty wrapper, or if you're American, you'll know that anyway. Um, so they're good for satellite uplinks and downlinks and radar and radio astronomy and cable TV and all the sort of systems where you've got impedance matching. Cable TV impedance is... What? 70 ohms. 70... Have a little go. Good. No. You can have a biscuit anyway. What, what, what is it? It's 70, 75 for Virgin and Sky and all that. What about for um, just a regular match system, usual impedance? Come on. 
you guys not do electromagnetic theory in second year anymore? When did we actually stop teaching engineering? Right, it's 50 ohms for a regular system, and you could have worked that out, even if you've never been lectured on it, because if you look at the data sheets I gave you at the start of the lecture, it says 50 ohms on the top. Um, so it is possible to win, it's just not very likely. What about the impedance of free space? E0 over mu0, if you want. I'll let you do it on a calculator quickly and see if you get a biscuit in a bit. So, the noise power available with the input of an ideal impedance match system is the input noise power multiplied by the power gain. So if there is no NA in this diagram, NA is zero, this is essentially noiseless, well essentially it is noiseless. And the only noise you get out is the noise you put in times the gain of the system. So NA is what contributes to an F bigger than 1, F being the noise factor. Sometimes people put noise factor in unmatched systems. I will do unmatched systems next, next lecture on Tuesday, but I want to say a few things now anyway. Power gain isn't very useful at low frequencies because we want to talk about voltage and current. We don't really want to talk about power, and you say, oh, well, I'll do V squared over R. Fine, no problem. In a match system, your R is always going to be 50 or 75 or something else that you know. In an unmatched system, some node on the transistor collector in some circuit, you have to worry about all the impedances are looking off that node, figure out what the overall value is, and then compute your F as if that's your characteristic impedance system impedance. And if you move to another node, you have to worry about all the impedances of that node and do it again. And you can't compare those two Fs without worrying about what impedance changes you've had. So the characteristic impedance in a match system is what makes it easy to compare noise factors with each other. That's why if I buy two amplifiers, <coughs> like the two in your data sheets, and they're both 50 ohm, I can compare their noise factors and just think, oh, that was bigger than that, this is the better amplifier. You might, if you want, have a little look at how much those amplifiers cost and have a think about why one is about twice the price of the other. We will come back to that. So, noise factor in unmatched systems must be careful. It's not always obvious. Generally speaking, you'd rather work out the mean square voltage as per the graph that I had from the oscilloscope when I said everything gets flipped and then you root it and get an average. I'll take the average then root it. You'd rather work with volts squared per hertz or volt, volts squared per root hertz, sorry, volts per root hertz, or amps squared per hertz or amps per root hertz, rather than try and worry about F. And if you look at the problem sheet for noise, first five questions or so are low frequency systems, and the last two or three are high frequency systems. And we'll have a look at an example towards the end of this lecture. So the input noise for an unmatched system is just the mean squared noise voltage at the input due to the source. And the noise out is the contribution of all the various noise sources. And unfortunately, if you don't have a characteristic impedance, you have to work them all out. But you can use the skills you already possess to figure out which noise source is the most important ones and which ones you can neglect. Just like when you analyse transistor circuit, you can know that sometimes you can neglect the early resistance and sometimes you don't have to worry about the base current. You can do the same sort of tricks to make the analysis easy. Of course it takes practice. <coughs> so let's go back to match systems, which is what I'm talking about at the minute. The output noise N0 is composed of the amplifier noise NA and the input noise NI multiplied by the power gain, which is just the equation on the prior slide. And an ideal amplifier has no noise as its output, so the noise signal entering will be multiplied by its power gain, and that's, that's all you have. So if you sub in the two word equations in this slide um, into, into four, you'll end up with five, where AP NI plus, NA plus NA is SO, and AP NI is Ni times the power gain, so it's the output noise of the perfect amplifier. And if you do some crossing out, 
it ends up being 1 plus NA over APNI. If you want to remember that result and not worry about how it's derived, that's okay. I'm very unlikely to ask the derivation, and having written the exam, that's a posteriori of information. That's to say, I know what's on the script, so it probably isn't going to get asked. You can just remember it. So if NA is zero, amplifier adds no noise, F is one, because the, the fraction here just disappears because the top zero. So perfect amplifier, F is one. And for the impedance match system, the NI is the power available from the source. So my situation is a source of noise with a resistance, and then I've got an amplifier, and inside the amplifier is an input resistance. Uh, let's call it R in, shall we? And this would be RS. This should be familiar because the other day I spent a lot of time worrying about the noise that could be transferred from a noisy resistor resist, a, re, ha, bleh, a noisy resistor to a noise free resistor and I said it was 4 kT times the bandwidth this is noise free because it's the resistance that we produce that represents the input resistance of the amplifier it's not necessarily a real resistance in the same way that RBE is not a real resistor it's one that we made up to make a model fit. So the noise power available from this source to this amplifier is KT delta F, which is why it turns up uh, there. NI is KT delta F. Unless I have put a diode here or something else that didn't have Gaussian noise but had shock noise, in which case it would be a slightly different answer. But I'm also very unlikely to do that. That's why it says at the bottom of that slide, remember lecture 10. Happy with the idea of noise factor as a metric of the goodness of an amplifier in terms of the noise it adds to a system? Fine. You can also find noise figure. Um, somebody in a marketing department somewhere got the idea that if you put it in dBs it makes the numbers look nicer. Very much like the safe operating area of a transistor is always put in log log, because in lin lin it looks awful. But when you do your calculations, it's got to do it in lin lin. So, noise figure, if you ever see it, convert it directly to noise factor and then ignore it. Uh, it's just 10 log f, because f is a ratio of powers. Happy with noise figure. Just in case you're wondering, this is. Um, it's a cutout of one of the data sheets, or a similar one, just to show you what it might look like, but since I'm giving them out anyway, the truth is, noise figure doesn't fill a whole slide, because it's just one equation, I need something to put in the space. So, you might use the noise factor to compute how good a two-stage amplifier is, rather than have to worry about nanovolts per root hell everywhere, we can try to use a noise factor. So many electronic, consistent, <coughs> many electronic systems consist of a cascade of circuits. I don't know why I write tongue twisters in my lectures, I must hate myself. So the analysis which follows, which is a few slides long, holds the match systems, but the underlying idea that we should get from the end of it all is that the noise of the first stage is critical, and the noise of the second stage doesn't usually matter. In fact, the amount that it doesn't matter by goes up as the gain of the first stage goes up. <coughs> to prove that. The point of all my analysis is to try and draw some conclusions about how to design circuits. Generally speaking, I don't ask for analysis in questions. Hint. So, noise power at the input, KT delta F, as per that. Noise factor of amplifier 1 and 2 are, just remember equation uh, 5, if you like, um, 1 plus NA1 over AP1, KT delta F, where KT delta F is NI, NA1 is the 
noise added by the first amplifier, and AP1 is the power gain of the first amplifier. Similar arguments for amplifier number two, except that two replaces one in all the equations. Happy with that? We'll keep going, we'll be happy at the end. So the output noise, N0, has three components. They are the output noise, which is due to the input noise. So I put some noise in as the noise comes out. And those two things are related by the power gain of the first amplifier times the power gain of the second amplifier. Because they are linear time invariant systems, and if you want to know what happens to them, you multiply their transfer functions. That's all that's just happened. It just so happens that the transfer function is just a number for gain, and I'm not worried about the frequency. Happy with linear time invariant systems. You're all dead keen on signals and systems, aren't you? It's really important to know the underlying concepts because it turns up everywhere, not just in the sort of stuff that I like to teach. Anyway, output noise due to input noise is the input noise times the power gain of the two things smooshed together. The output noise due to the first amplifier. So this is NA1. A certain fraction of NA1 appears at the output. And it's NA1 times the gain of the second amplifier. Just imagine the first amplifier is not there and there's a noise source at the input of the first amp second amplifier, which is the noise of the first amplifier. And then there's the output noise due to the second amplifier, and that doesn't have any gain to come because it's right at the output anyway, so that's just NA2. So the total noise of the real amplifier is just 10 plus 11 plus 12. It's plus because we have to, well, I'm assuming this is watts per, per hertz. In other words, when I said last lecture, you cannot add noise sources, we have to do mean squared plus mean squared all rooted. This has already had that done, so I'm just doing the plus bit. I'm not breaking my own rules. And if you substitute 10, 11 and 12 together, uh, you get 13, which is very pleasant for you. Luckily, that simplifies down to 14 by just some crossing out, which I'm not going to do. The noise of the ideal amplifier is the noise we put in times the gain of the two of them together. No extra noise from anywhere. So if you put 14 on the top and 10 on the bottom and do a bit of cancellation, you end up with 15. And 15 is the reason I've done that is I'm a signal to noise ratio of the output and signal to noise ratio of the input to give me where's my pointer on? to give me this one. So this top bit is just equation 14, and this bit is just equation 10. Anyway, it all turns out to be this. So when I said at the beginning, okay, uh, noise of the first stage is important, noise factor of the first stage plus noise factor of the second stage minus one, one probably not very significant, divided by power gain of the first stage. So to make F as small as possible, F1 wants to be as small as possible, and AP1 wants to be as big as possible. And if you can make it really huge, F2 is no longer going to be very significant. And that is essentially what I've said in this, this business here. So for a design rule, if you just want something to remember forever, noise factor of first stage, really important, gain of first stage as big as possible, then you're in a pretty good position. Doesn't mean it's optimal, just means you're likely to be in the right area. Right, that analysis won't come up. How long have I got? 20 minutes. So I'm going to do a question like you would find on a problem sheet, because I promised I would, and we've done rather a lot of theory without too much numbers. So I gave out two data sheets. Um, one of them is for the ZVA183+. Plus. And the other one is for the ZRIN HG+. I don't have shares in mini circuits, by the way. It's just that they make really good advertising. Or well, do I have shares in mini circuits? So we put these two amplifiers together, and I'm telling you the key statistics on the slides, but if you dig about in the data sheets which I've given out, you can find where these numbers came from, so I've just copied them. I never liked the idea that lecturers just produce numbers out of the thin air and never bother to explain where their examples came from. So in this instance, 
I explained it in full. Also, there's a good chance that many of you have never really come across any microwave components before. And if you haven't, I thought it would be nice if you could actually see what a data sheet looks like. So, the gain of the 183 is 26.64 dB, and the gain of the 8G plus is 25.64 dB. Um, and then noise figures are 2.56 dB and 4.29 dB, respectively. So the first thing we'll do is convert those into noise factor. If you actually want to dig about in the data sheets, I'm on the, the tables and I'm running off to, I think, 12 bucks. We want to know... Well, we want to know several things, but the amplifier <coughs> bandwidth that we're interested in is 1 gigahertz centered on 7 gigahertz. So, uh, if you want an example for that, maybe I want to eavesdrop on my neighbor's Wi-Fi and they're on one of the higher channels which goes up to about 6.5, 7 gigahertz. Just say. Although, if you're reading the news today, I'm much more likely to be hacking hard drive firmware. Anybody read that? <coughs> nope. Yeah. I'm quite surprised you don't read the news in my lectures. I once had somebody watching the snooker. But when I asked him what the score was, he didn't know, so anyway. What is the gain of the series combination? So you've got these two amplifiers, you plug the output of one into the input of the other, and then you measure the output at the end of it all, given some input. Gain of the series combination. Then we want to know what's the noise factor. Well, you just convert from dB from the noise figure to the noise factor. And then it wants to know the noise figure of the combination. Well, there's a good chance that we use equation 15 for that. <coughs> the total added noise power delivered to the load. That actually takes a little bit more working out. We have to worry about the, the transfer of noise between the amplifier and the load. And then we want to know the signal to noise ratio of the output. Well, we just need the signal and the noise of the output, divide one by the other. And I've given the, uh, the input as a picowatt. Picowatt's an unbelievably small amount, by the way. And then last of all, we'll do the noise temperature, just because I put it in at the end of the last lecture. And the question says the maximum available noise power, um, I should have in brackets there, from a resistor, is KT delta F watts, uh, where delta F is the bandwidth, and the bandwidth is given in the question as 1 gigahertz. Happy with the question? I am not happy. Understand the question. No, so the gain of the noise factor, so the gain combination is found by converting to lin 26.64 which is the gain of the 183 and 25.64 which is the gain of the, uh, the 8G plus, uh, multiplying them and then converting that back into decibels. And if you do that it's 461 times 366 and it's about 1.69 times 10 to the 5 watts per watt. So for every watt you put in, you get in, uh, get out, sorry, 169,000 kilowatts. That watt, 169 kilowatts. If you want to, you can just add them in dB, and that works very nicely as well, because when you add two logarithms, you multiply them. But I know, because I wrote the question, um, that I need the linear ones later, so I've done it now. Then the noise factor of the 183 at 7 gigahertz, um, the at 7 gigahertz is because if you look at the graphs on the data sheets I've given you, the noise factor changes with frequency. We do 10 raised to the t.56 over 10 and it comes out as 1.8, <coughs> we've just converted uh, decibels to linear. And the same goes for the, the 8G plus and it's 2.8. 6853. So, for my argument that says gain of the first stage should, I'm sorry, gain of the first stage should be high and the noise factor in the first stage should be low, I probably want to choose the 183 as my first stage amplifier because it's got the better noise factor. And the only reason I'm allowed to compare those noise factors is because they're both 50 ohm characteristic impedance amplifiers. Happy with the maths on that slide? Reasonably routine stuff, I think. So the noise figure of the combination and the noise power in the load, a bit trickier this. 
<coughs> to find the noise figure, we'll use this equation 15, but I've just stated it. F1 plus F2 minus 1 over the power gain of the first stage. And we have 1.8032 plus 2.6851 minus 1 over the power gain. So this is, that's the gain of the first stage, that's the noise factor of the second stage, and that's the noise factor of the first stage. And it turns out to be 1.80667. So if you compare this number and this number, see how they're more or less the same? Two, one, two, three, three significant digits, they're the same. This is the bit contributed by the first stage, and the rest, the difference between that and that, that bit there, contributed by second stage. Now I picked two really nice amplifiers for this. Um, they cost about $1,200 between them. But, it just shows you if you can make your AP1 really big, you don't have to worry about how expensive your second amplifier might be. And when I say expensive, I'm equating directly cost and performance not worrying about who supplied it or that sort of thing. Not all amplifiers are made equal. Happy with my use of this formula? Sure. Happy with the overall idea behind the question? But if I said to you, instead of the question I said, if I asked another question which had an extra bit at the beginning, draw me a schematic of the overall system, could you do it? So I would rate that as more important than all this maths. Because if you don't understand the question, you're doomed. A textbook can tell you all the maths, or you can get it out of my lecture notes. But if you don't understand what the question's asking you, you're totally stuffed. And that's the point of the midterm, which is horrible for all of you, well, most of you, was that you can have all the answers, but if you don't understand the question, it doesn't help. Do you want me to draw a diagram of the system? Right, okay. It looks like... Uh, I never got one of the slide, did I? Not that's on the video. The reason for this is it's um, Chinese New Year. Well, not right now, but a while ago. And my best camera person is... Uh, well, I gave him a holiday because he wrote me a nice journal paper. That's how PhDs work. You can only have a holiday when you've done something good. Right, so we'd have a source. This is our noise source. Uh, which has got a noise power available of uh, KT delta F. Is that big enough? In watts? And then we have an amplifier, amplifier number one. We gain AP1 and a noise factor of What's the noise factor? <coughs> 1.8 something. 1.8. Uh, 3. 3. 3. 3. And then I have another amplifier with a gain of AP2 and a noise factor of um, 4. Point something, isn't it? Oh no, 2.68. Sorry. Ah, the dB was 4. Point something. 2.68, whatever, and then I'm measuring the noise output here. And this will be RS. And this noise here is the noise due to this resistor. And this resistor now has no noise, because we took all the noise and put it there instead. Happy with that? Right then. So back to where we are in the question. Oh, I've said on the slide, notice how little effect the noise factor of the second stage has. You've got that, right? It's a key thing to take away. So the noise figure, we'll just convert back to dB. That is 2.56 something or other. So with the, the power that we can get <coughs> into the load, there are several ways of doing this. If you want to, you can work out the total available power at the output, divide through by 50 ohms to get it in volts, squared, and then do a potential divide, take roots, do a potential divider, square it up and carry it on like that, and that's okay. 
works, give you the same answer. I, however, have cheated and transposed uh, the new phase equation to give me a slightly different form. So I can transpose it to give me NA, which is the noise the amplifier adds, as a function of the power gain of the overall system and the input noise to the system and the noise factor of the system. So what I've done is said, well, if this is an amplifier with certain specifications and this is an amplifier with certain specifications, I can just make them all go together into one big amplifier with different specifications, gain and, and noise factor. And that's all there is to it. So you don't have to worry about which amplifier is which anymore. There is just one amplifier. camera person business is harder than it looks. I should pay a bit more. Nah. So we've just combined these two amplifiers together and now I'm going to say they've got one noise factor and they've only got one gain and the gain is going to be 161,000 something or other and the noise factor <coughs> is going to be 1.8 <coughs> 1.80667, which is the noise factor of the overall system. Having done that, I can use my equation for noise factor in terms of power added and the power in, shuffle it around to give me this side of things, where I've got the noise added by the amplifier on its own. And then I know everything. I know that F is 1.80667, that the power gain is 169,045, it's 25 degrees C at the time we did the test, and the input noise available is KT delta F, and I know what delta F is because I gave you the question. Sub everything in, noise power available, 4.11 picowatts, that's 10 to the minus 12. I sub that into my equation 23. I'll have 169,045 times 4.1 picowatts times the noise factor minus one. Output noise available, 5.65 nanowatts, which isn't very much. Certainly wouldn't keep you warm at night. Just to give you some perspective, on an average day in an average part of the world, the GPS power at the Earth's surface, that's to say available to your phone antenna, if you've got GPS on your phone, is about 10 nanowatts. That has nothing to do with the question. I just wanted to give you a benchmark. And we can compute the signal to noise ratio, which is the next thing it asks for, um, by a number of methods. Just as you can compute the power available by a number of methods, I'm going to carry on with using F. So my main definition for F, the noise factor, is a signal input power divided by the noise input power, which is the noise available from the source divided by the signal output power divided by the noise output power which is just the noise <coughs> input power times the power gain plus the noise the amplifier adds. Now we already know that the power available at the input is 4.11 picowatts because that's KT delta F and we know that the input power signal, this is Let's assume it's a sine wave, just for the sake of argument. Although well, it could be, a, I don't know, CD4 QAM or a CDMA signal or whatever you want. Um, let's imagine it's a sine wave. One picowatt is what it's worth. So we'll do a picowatt divided by 4.11 picowatts, which would give us 0 0.24304. That's a signal to noise ratio. So the signal to noise ratio is less than one. And all that means is the noise is bigger than the signal. That has implications for how we can measure whatever it is we're trying to look at, because it's not easy to see something that's buried in noise. But the fact that the number is less than one should not be frightening. That's not to say you shouldn't be frightened by it, it's just that I wouldn't want it to frighten you, if that's clear. It's not unusual, put it that way. So if we were transposing 27, which is 
just our definition for noise factor. <coughs> we can try and get the noise signal to noise ratio of the output, which is just SO over NO. So I've just done a quick transposition there. Nobody wants to see that, do they? Good. Um, so signal to noise ratio of the input is on the top, and the noise factor of the amplifier is on the bottom. Uh, divide one by the other, 0.13425. Notice how this number is smaller than this number. That is extremely encouraging. If it wasn't, it would mean that our amplifier made the signal to noise ratio better, which is not really very likely because the amplifier just makes the signal bigger and it adds in some noise. So the best you can ever hope for is this number equals that number. And if you can do that, your amplifier doesn't have any noise at all, which makes it incredibly special and definitely worth patenting. I was going to warn you about the next joke, wasn't I? Never mind. Um, so this number are always smaller than this number. So what would the noise temperature be? Well, I was quite pushed for time last, last time we spoke. So I'll just tell you what it is again briefly. Oh, quite push the time there. Who'd have thunk it? If I took a resistor and I heated it up until it had a certain amount of noise, and then I compared that noise with a certain amplifier, and I found those two noises to be the same, I could call the noise temperature of the amplifier whatever temperature I heated the resistor up to. Now, it can be shown that noise factor is 1 plus the effective temperature, which is the temperature I have to heat the resistor up to to make the noises the same, divided by the actual temperature of the amplifier. The reason that we like the noise effective temperature is I know what value of resistor I have to heat up. It will be the characteristic of heat. If I was in an unmatched system, effective noise temperature is a bit wibbly a lot of my noise factor. Can't really apply it unless you're really careful. So you can derive this if you want to. I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to say if you want to remember it, that's fine. So 1 plus T effective over 25 degrees Celsius. Um, shuffle it all around, sub in the numbers, 240 <coughs> Kelvin. So if I had a 50 ohm resistor, because it's a 50 ohm characteristic impedance, and I lowered its temperature to minus 32 point something degrees Celsius, it would have the same amount of noise as my amplifier system would. That's all that means. Happy with the idea of noise temperature? Right then, if you look at the tutorial, no, I'm not sure, sorry, problem sheet. The problem sheet, not allowed to say tutorial. If you look at the problem sheet on noise, question seven is extremely similar. So that was a little run through for you. On Tuesday we will deal with unmatched systems. <laughs>